So, on to our uh, first speakers of the day. I don't really think they need any introduction, but um, as you can tell, I like to talk, so I'm going to do one anyway. Um, these Aidan April, CEO and CPO of Cooper Parry, um, have an amazing story to share with you. I've heard them tell this story probably about five times now, and every single time it's fresh, it's inspiring, and I'm blown away by the story that they're going to tell. Um, they uh, not only uh, feature in the top 15 of the Sunday Times 100 companies to work for, but at our recent awards, the Employee Engagement Awards, they went away with a hat trick of trophies, and they are officially the best company to work for in Europe. Um, so we Woo! Have... <laughs> yeah, I like it. So I will now hand over to Aidan April to tell us exactly why that's the case. Okay, guys, the floor is yours. All right. <laughs> sure bit of music there. Hi, everyone. I'm Aid. Uh, I'm the CEO of Kupari, and I've been the chief executive for the last six years now. And I'm April, head of people and culture, and... Um, just want to say a massive thank you to everyone for coming. It's great to see a full room. I've seen loads of familiar faces, lots of new faces. Uh, so really look forward to talking to you all throughout the day. So we're going to kick things off today, and we're going to talk to you about something that Cooper Parry is becoming increasingly famous for, and that is the, the emphasis that we place on our culture. Okay? So we thought the best way to do that would be to kind of walk you through the journey that we've been on as, as a business, to essentially share with you the, the story of how we've changed a very old, traditional business into the fastest growing firm of accountants in the UK. So I'm going to start us off. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the backstory, kind of how we changed, why we changed. April's going to jump up here now and then and just pause the story and, and sort of ask you a few questions to start to get you to think about your own cultures. She's then going to come up after about 30 minutes or so and go a lot deeper into our own culture and share some of the stuff that we do here at Cooper Parry. And then I'm going to finish off uh, with some of the challenges we're facing now as a business and kind of what the future looks like. Okay? Should we go? Okay. All right. So let me get started. So anybody here from Derby? Oh, only a few of you. Only a few of you. Okay, well, our story starts in Derby, okay? Way back in 1850. Right, so when a young man, William Watson, set himself up as an accountant. So that's how Cooper Parry started. Okay? So essentially we've been around a long time. That's 169 years of trading. The earliest known photo we have is this one. Okay, so this is Cooper Parry in 1900, everybody. Right? So already 50 years of trading by this point. Now, if we fast forward another 100 years or so to the year 2004, the firm's over 150 years old. So a lot of history, a lot of tradition, a lot of heritage. It, it, we were the oldest firm of accountants in Derbyshire. And 2004 was the year that I joined. Okay? Here's a shot of the partners at the time. Now, the first thing you might notice here is uh, not a lot seems to have changed, right? It's like 1900. <laughs> 2004. Now, the next thing you might notice is they are all male, they're all white, they're all wearing suits, they're all wearing shirts, they're all wearing ties. Like a pretty serious bunch, yeah? Now, the thing is that outside of work, these guys are quite fun, quite colourful guys. But in work, and as a business, they felt the need to conform and stick with tradition. To look like accountants, yeah? Now, the business was in good hands, it was in good shape, but culture wasn't really anything that anybody ever talked about. So it kind of just, kind of just happened. So Cooper Parry just ended up conforming to the traditional version of what everybody thought accountants needed to look like. Pretty grey, pretty dull, and, and pretty boring. Okay? So I joined in 2004. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> you 
you shouldn't laugh at this point. Right. <laughs> this, is, this is my first day right, at Cooper Parry. Dark suits, white shirt, tie. So I, too, conformed to the culture of Cooper Parry. And I recall very clearly my first day. So this was our building in 2004. Um, some of you may know this building if you're from Derbyshire, but this was a real rabbit warren of a building. And I remember very clearly being kind of brought in and meeting a few people. And I was taken to my office. I had an office then. Um, it was under the stairs. It was quite small. It was about two by two. Um, it was damp. Uh, the walls had like 20 coats of paint on the wall. It was a yellow. It wasn't quite like this yellow, but it was, there was a yellow there, I recall. Um, but there was mold and it was damp. And I'm like, damn, what, are, what am I doing here? What have I joined? And then I went upstairs to meet the partners, right? And the partners all had their offices upstairs and everyone else was, was downstairs. And then I went to meet the chairman and he had the biggest corner office in the building and he had this like really long desk and he sat kind of where Lee is at the front here and, and I sat at the other end and I'm thinking, wow, this is bigger than my office, right? And then I came out of the office and a lady came past making tea on a trolley, just for the partners, no one else. So there's this like um, real hierarchy and a real upstairs, kind of downstairs feel to, to Cooper Parry and a, and a lot of closed doors. So that was my experience when I joined, that was 15 years ago. Now, fortunately, I joined at a time of real change. So I, t I joined at a time when the guys that you saw in the previous photo started to retire and a group of 30-year-olds came together. Okay, so there's this generational change around 2004, 2005. These guys, so um, a group of 30-year-olds came together. We uh, had a lot of similar backgrounds, had a lot in common. A lot of us have worked in national firms of accountants and big four <coughs> firms. Um, yeah, and we kind of left those firms for the same reasons. The politics, the, the bureaucracy, the red tape. That, that drove us all out of those firms. You know, so we, we ended up at Cooper Parry, and we wanted it to be very different. Right? We wanted to be different from the firms that we'd left, and very different to this firm that we now found ourselves in, with this upstairs, <laughs> downstairs kind of feel to it. You know, we wanted to really challenge all the stereotypes of accountants. I'm honest, none of us really like being accountants. Okay. Is there any accountants in the room? No? Two of us, three of us, right. <laughs> Stay well clear, yeah? Um, so we knew we wanted to be different, right? Yeah, we wanted to build something very different from the firms that we left and very different from the firm that we found ourselves in. Um, we didn't know what that meant or how that looked. We just knew we wanted to be different. And so sort of create the sort of business where we'd all love to work. Yeah? It's kind of, it was as simple as that. So there was this generational change. We wanted to be different. We had no idea how it looked. So we just started to follow our hearts and started to run the business on, on three very simple principles. Um, the first one was hire as many talented people as possible. Okay? So we were just interested in smart, passionate people with attitude. The second principle was, hey, we're, we're only here once, right? So, you know, we wanted to compete hard, but we really wanted to enjoy the ride as well. So we wanted to have a lot of fun in this business. And then the third principle was we wanted to be different. We really wanted to distance ourselves from accountants, right? So we started to build into our brand this, this following strap line, which was we don't do great. Yeah, we wanted to really move ourselves away from this kind of perception of grey, dull, boring, me too accountants. Now the thing is, back in 2004, most firms of accountants, their brands were blue and grey. Everybody looked the same. And so did Cooper Parry. So this was some of our brand back in 2004. Who'd like to receive that, yeah? <laughs> See the blue, the grey, really traditional typography here. It's like badge of honour, chartered accountants. Didn't stand out. So the very first thing that we did, as this new generation did, was we changed the brand. So we changed the way we went to market. We changed the way we looked. 
and we went from this to this. Okay, so we went to market with colour, big bold colours, very simple imagery, a much more modern typeface, lowercase. You know, we quickly dropped this reference to chartered accountants. Um, had a playful tone of voice. Um, yeah, there weren't too many firms of accountants calling themselves ballsy back in 2004. And we just started to hit the market with, with our brand. Um, we weren't too sure how well it would be received, but it worked really well. And people started to talk about our brand and started to talk about, they're a bit different, aren't they? They're a bit colourful. And, it, and it's as simple as the colour started to stand us out in a very crowded market. And we started to grow really fast, and we started to move up the food chain. So we were starting to look after bigger and bigger businesses all the time, and businesses that were just like us. Fast-moving, fast-growing entrepreneurial businesses. We opened up new service lines. We started to expand geographically and in new cities. And we'd set our sights on being one of the top 20 firms in the UK. And we went from being outside the top 35 in 2004, and then we broke into the top 30, and then we went to 29, and then 28. 2007, we got to number 28. Uh, you know, we weren't perfect by any stretch. We made tons of mistakes, but we had this real, uh, like, swagger and belief about us. And we thought we were on this unstoppable kind of growth curve. And I remember the Christmas party that year, you know, a room like this, grabbing a glass, celebrating what a year it's been. Isn't next year going to be even better? The year we were heading into was um, 2008. <laughs> so halfway through this year we lost over three quarters of a million pound okay with hindsight we'd we'd overstretched we'd lost our focus uh we were dabbling in too many areas in all honesty we were we were a little too arrogant as well and but to be frank we were staring down the barrel in 2008 and just to survive we were going to have to make some very, very tough and painful decisions and let a lot of people go. Okay? So we went through this very painful restructuring in 2008. We lost a lot of people. We went from 293 people to 161 in 12 months. Okay? So 44% of our team left the business in 2008. So this was a very brutal, uh, horrible period for us as a business. None of us had been through anything like that before. We'd been about growth and getting the very best people. Now we're having to let those people go. Uh, horrible period. Left a real cloud hanging over us for at least two years. Yeah, We completely lost the engagement of our people. We were not very good at all back then at communicating. So, you know, we were in the trenches, we were making decisions every day just to survive, but we were not very good at all at bringing people with us or explaining why we were having to do what we were having to do. So we didn't explain it, we didn't bring the team with us, and we lost the, the goodwill and engagement of our team for at least two years. Yeah? But we got through this restructuring period very quickly, uh, and I, I essentially bought some time, yeah? So uh, we bought some time, uh, time to and a chance to rebuild okay, and think. So really a time to kind of stand back, start to think about things. So we, did, we went through this whole period of strategizing and a lot of soul searching. You know, we learned so much from that period as a business. You know, we started to ask ourselves tons of questions. Well, why were we trying to be top 20 anyway? What did that mean? Why did we come together in the first place? Why do we get out of bed every day? What is it we're trying to do? How do we now compete and win in a very different market? You know, the market had moved on with double dip recession by this point. So we did a ton of strategizing, uh, and from all that, we realized we got it all wrong. Okay? We thought we were great, we thought we were doing brilliant, but we got it all wrong. We were just trying to do too many things with too many people. Yeah? We're just chasing the shiny stuff, and every opportunity you saw, we were chasing it down. And we're trying to please too many people. So from this realization came in a new vision, uh, a new strategy, a very simple one. Uh, it was this. So from this point, we now said, hey, we're only going to do something if we can truly be the best. So this was very simple. We wanted to be number one in everything that we, that we did. And if we couldn't be number one, we would stop doing it. 
yeah? So this was all about uh, focus, playing to strengths. This was about finding high growth, high margin markets where we felt we could compete and we, and we could win, okay? So every part of our business went through a strategic review. What does number one mean? Who is the best? How do we get there? How do we measure it? How do we beat them? Can we beat them? Um, doing all right for time, yeah? Doing okay for time? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. I was gonna take this out if we're running late, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I'll give you an example um, of what this meant. So, uh, can everybody see this? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll draw it and then I'll, and then I'll explain it. I'll, let me draw this and then I'll explain it. Some music on it, this bit. Right, okay. Uh, I think that's it. Can everybody see that? Can you see it at the back? Okay, so um, this represents the audit market in the East Midlands, okay? So just work with that for a minute. So we've in, uh, we did a lot of uh, segmentation in our market. So essentially, we, did a, we looked at the market hard and we segmented it and we found businesses from 0 to 5 million, from 5 to 50, and 50 north, okay? And what we've got in our market in 2008-9, we had the big four firms in every city that we operated in, Derby, Nottingham, and Leicester. They're great at those top ends, PLC, international stuff. But they also dropped into this space here. So at the bottom end of their client base, they have clients down here. Okay? Then what we've got in our market is tons of small local competitors. So high volume, small firms of accountants that have a high volume, a smaller number of, cli of clients. So they've got clients down in this space, but they've all got one or two kind of trophy clients. So they've got one or two at the larger end in this space. Everybody following this? Yeah? And then we've got the national firms of accountants. I joined from one, and we would have looked at a small local corner shop all the way up to a listed entity. So no real focus back then from the national firms. So we simply said to ourselves, hey, can we, can we beat these guys here? Can we beat these guys here? And can we beat these guys here, right? So we identified this slice here, privately owned businesses in the East Midlands turning over five to 50 million, okay? And uh, just seen someone I know. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> seen, seen you for ages, you are. Um, <laughs> through me, through me. Um, let me get back to the story. Um, so, so we put everything into this, our, bi our business development, our marketing, we structured our business to service this space here. Fast-growing fast entrepreneurial businesses that were privately owned in the East Midlands, turning five to 50 million. And we just attacked the number six firm and then number five and then four and then three and then two. We put league tables all around the building. We would celebrate every single win and make a ton of noise about it internally. And we finally got to like going head to head with Tenon, who were number one at the time. They had the largest market share. And then we pulled away from them and we beat them and we started to pull away. Okay? So we, it took us 18 months, but we got to a point where we had the largest market share of privately owned businesses in the East Midlands, earning five to 50 million. Okay? And then we pushed that up to 100 mil and went after five to 100 mil and we got a number one. And then we pushed it up to 200 mil, we pushed the base to 10 million, and we went after this slice, 10 million turnover businesses, up to 200 mil, and we got to number one. And every part of our business went through a strategic review, very similar to that, reshaped, refocused, attacked the market. Uh, I've lost the clicker now. What am I clicking? See ya. <laughs> Following on from John, yeah? Right, okay. So every part, I mean, and I could take you through 10 versions of that, what it meant for tax, what it meant for IT, how we structuring business, every part of our business, but that's what it meant for our, our audit business. So essentially, we got to this place here. Uh, this is 10 million to 200 mil private owned businesses in the East Midlands. We have 12% uh, of the market share, almost three times the market share of the number two firm, which is BDO. Okay, so let me summarize here. So we've been on this, we go for this generational change. We got it on a very steep growth curve. We think we're killing it. We get into serious trouble. We restructure, we buy time, we set a new vision. 
we come out the other side, we really laser focus now and we start a win. So we're going to pause the story there for a minute. Um, I mentioned that April's going to jump up. She's going to ask you some questions to get you thinking about your own culture now. Uh, and this is the first moment. So she's going to ask you a quick question. Thank you. Okay, so as I said, 2008, we lost the goodwill of the team, the trust wasn't there, and they recognised that they need to do something different. And the first thing they started to do was to think about what is the culture that we've got in this business. Now, they didn't necessarily use the word culture back then. It wasn't really that the buzzword that it is today. But they started to recognise that they needed to do something to make the environment for their people better. And how were they going to do that? So they first needed to start to think about what was the actual culture that they had today. So I'd like you all just to stop for a second and think about your own businesses. So I think you've all been given a notebook in your bags, I believe, or pen and, pen and paper. Has everybody got pen and paper? If you could just grab those for me, that'd be great. Okay, so it looks like most of you have grabbed something, I think. So I just want you to think. Think about your business right now, as it is today. And I'm going to ask you to write some stuff down. And you're not going to have to share this with anybody else in the room. This is just for you. So I want you to think about how does that culture feel? How would you describe it? How would your people describe it? How do you describe it to your partner when you go home? How does it feel? So I just want you to take a couple of words, put, pop a couple of words down, a sentence, a list, whatever works for you. I'm going to put pop some words on the screen that will just help you think about different words for culture, but write your own down, whatever, could go with your gut, what comes to mind, so don't, you don't need to overthink this, okay? We're just going to take 60 seconds, give you a bit of time to think about it, okay? Okay, everyone finished. So I want you to hold on to that bit of paper. We are going to come back to it in a little bit of time, but I'm going to hand back to Wade because I'm sure you're really, really keen to hear what happened next in the story. Okay, so back to the story. Uh, so what you've just done there, starting to think about the culture, how would you articulate it, how would you describe it? That's, that's exactly what we started to do. 2009-10, okay? We started to think about, hey, well, what culture have we got? How would we describe this? And what we found, again, was that we didn't have the culture that we wanted, or we thought we had, yeah? What we, what we actually had was quite a siloed culture, okay? So we had three offices at the time, Derby, Nottingham, Leicester. We had three very different ways of operating in each office. Is anyone in multi-office businesses here, a few of you? <laughs> Maybe you relate to this. We had three very different ways, three different cliques, uh, inter-office rival rivalry, and we were finding it um, more and more difficult to kind of collaborate and work across offices. Our offices were aging. The workspace was kind of traditional as well and not suited to what we, what we felt we needed, but it was more about kind of trying to get everyone together. So we, knew, we realized we needed to change that. To change the culture, we needed to change something here. So, we wanted to create one single space that was open, was inspiring, was colourful, was collaborative. Um, and we moved here to, to Skyview. Okay. Um, so we moved here five years, five years ago now, maybe six, five or six years ago. Um, and the brief that we gave to our designers, and they're here today, and Claire is here, and she'll be up here shortly to talk to you, was... What does the firm of accountants look like? Think about that and then do the exact opposite. So that was the brief, yeah? And we kind of said, hey, go Google as well. That was as short as that, yeah? Um, so I'm just going to play you a quick video now. It's 60 seconds long. That will just give you a flavor of the building, uh, but also our culture. This is something that we shot maybe five years ago when we first moved here. But 
hopefully it'll, it'll kind of give you a, a feel for it. We take fun. Seriously. We don't do great. But we do do colour. We face up. And dress down. We reach out. And take in. We in. And yank. We win. Often. We lose. Now and again. Prosecutors. You sold to number one. We're the UK's fastest growing accountant. Okay, so we created this really modern um, collaborative workspace that was just perfect for a multi-generational business which, and a workforce, which by this point we were. And you'll, you'll hear more about that from April in a minute. But this was a truly transformational move for us. Um, hopefully you get a chance to work, walk around the space and see a bit of it today. But uh, you know, you'll see there's no offices. Uh, there's, nobody has an office, I don't have an office, it's completely agile, we don't even have a desk, yeah, we all, we're kind of all hot desk, agile around the building. We've got music playing through the building, so we've got noisy zones, we've got quiet focus zones, we've got tons of collaborative space, um, we've got fish. <laughs> there's a reason, yeah, there's a reason behind a lot of this. So, did you know that having fish in the office has proven to reduce anxiety levels by 12%? Yeah, all right. You know that? So there's a ton of stuff that we do here that is, hey, well, why not? Let's just let's give it a try. And there's a ton of stuff that's backed by science and research and data. And we trial and error and we experiment tons, but there's reasons for the fish, okay? Uh, we have treadmill desks, we've got a stand-up desk, we have quicker, more productive meetings proven if you have stand-up meeting rooms. Tons of fun space. Um, but what happened here was that we very quickly started to become famous for our workspace. So something like three months after moving here, the Sunday Times listed us as one of the best offices in the, in the country. And suddenly, everybody in our market was talking about our office. We've got to go and see Kupari's office. Has anyone been here before? A few of you, yeah, yeah. Um, and we, I mean, we, we literally tour people still, five years on, every day around this building. People coming to us every day going, hey, can we come in and see the space? You'll hear how that's evolved now, and they now want to come and talk about culture, not just the space. But initially, it was the space that pulled everyone in. So the, the move here helped drive huge growth for us. You saw the market share that we got to. So we got to this point where we were dominating the East Midlands. We said, hey, we now want to dominate the Midlands, not just the East Midlands. So we set our sights on being number one in the Midlands, not the East Midlands. We went looking for the right sort of firm in Birmingham. We completed an acquisition in 2016, a firm that maybe some of you have heard of, Clement Keys. I don't know if anybody knows of Clement Keys. Uh, a really strong local firm in Birmingham, in good shape, but phenomenally traditional. Yeah. I mean, we, we could spend a week talking about the integration of that business culturally, and maybe April will get into some of that. Um, but they were much like Cooper Power was when I joined in 2004, okay? You remember when I talked to you about blue and grey brands? Well, here was Climbing Keys. Yeah. So this is 2016 now, not 2004. I don't know if you can see it, but it says Chartered Accountants. They were still working that very hard in 2016, okay? So we switched the brand immediately from this to this. Um, so this is another stage of the evolution of our, of our brand um, and some of the stuff that we did early when we went into the Birmingham marketplace. So you can see how it's evolved from some of the stuff I showed you in 2004, but it's still colourful, it's still different, it's still playful, it's still us. Uh, this is it in situ. So this is the biggest digital billboard in, in Europe, um, just as you enter Birmingham on the A38 uh, and you can see how we kind of, again, Played, played a little bit. This was before we entered the market, so it was a kind of, hey, it doesn't say accountants anywhere on that screen, yeah? The next picture was their workspace. So this was Clement Key's workspace. Who wants to work there? <laughs> what this doesn't show is the partners had all their offices around this perimeter. Tall, dark, mahogany doors, no light coming into the building, the doors were closed again. 
It's really, a really formal space. Nobody talked, nobody smiled. You'd, cr you'd pass people in the corridor, they wouldn't look up at you. So it was really missing something. I had no soul, I had no energy, no vibe, nothing. Um, so once again, we found a great site. We moved out of the city centre, near to Birmingham Airport this time. And we moved here. Um, I know some of you have been here, a few of you have been to this space. This is our, this is our space now in Birmingham. So um, different in detail and feature, but exactly the same feel to, to here at Skyview. So our two spaces feel like like one. There's tons of colour and energy again, I'll fly through this. Load of collaborative workspace, loads of fun again, you know, we've got swings through the building, we've got this like running track that runs through the building. We have people on bikes, skateboards, segways flying around here. There's a basketball court there, this corner here. Uh, this one's great, it's got a sports bar, American sports bar. We have free beer, we trust our people to do what's right in the day. Um, but very similar to here, we quickly started to become known in the West Midlands for our, for our office space. So this is the, uh, the Telegraph this time, listed as, as one of the 10 coolest offices in the country. And now we tour people around this office. So again, it kind of repeated in the West Midlands market. People started to talk about our office space. They also designed this office space. This was a few years on, so it's a bit more modern. Yeah? thing is, though, that um, physically moving both times really enabled us to drive huge change culturally, much faster than we could have done if we'd have had removed locations. Okay? So it enabled us to drive huge cultural change. And April is now going to talk you through what that looks like uh, and some of the stuff that we do uh, at Cooper Parry. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to talk to you a bit about Cooper Parry and some of the things that we've done for our culture and some of the things that we're doing now. Just give you a little bit of a flavour and, um, uh, and explain to you why we place it ahead of absolutely everything that we do. Um, but before I do that, I'm just going to tell you and share with you why culture is so important to me personally. So my very first job, proper job, was actually in a firm of accountants. It was horrible. It was a bit like the office that you just saw up there. And I hated it. So I left. And I vowed never to step foot inside an accountancy firm ever again. Well, here I am. And I went on to work in HR, found my passion, found my calling, found the thing that really, really mattered to me. And a role where I felt that I could have a real impact on people's lives and a real impact on shaping the culture of a business. And when the opportunity came up at Cooper Parry, as you can imagine, I was quite sceptical and quite hesitant. And I was convinced by somebody I knew to come along and just have a coffee and have a chat with Aid. And I did. And when I walked in, first of all, it didn't look like a stereotypical firm of accountants. But then I actually spoke to Aid, and I spoke to a number of other people across the business, and what I found was this just constant, consistent message about people that really got culture. They got what it was about and they understood how important it was to create an environment that really fostered engagement through people. So also there was this great opportunity for me to be part of a business that was growing and evolving and changing as well. So the message that came across was we've created something great but actually we're not just going to stand still here. The world changes, people change, generations change, we've got to continue to keep evolving our culture if we want to still be a great employer. So that, that's why I joined, and that's why it's so important to me. So I guess one of the, things, one of the questions that we are always pondering and continue to, to ponder at Cooper Parry is whether or not our culture is helping or hindering our growth. And we know that a great culture, and I guess most of you in the room here know that a great culture, that's why you're here to, to listen to some of the great speakers we've got today, it not only increases the engagement of your people, but it also really improves the experience for your customers and your clients as well. And that in turn goes on to then build a really successful business. So it has a real impact on the bottom line, this stuff. And every single business has a culture. All of your businesses will have a culture. You all wrote some words down earlier to describe your culture today. 
but for a lot of businesses, culture will just happen. If we don't proactively take control of what we want that culture to look like, it will just happen, and not always in a good way. So the journey that Aid shared with you so far led us to really step back and stop and ask, what was the culture that we wanted to create it? What did we want people to say about us? And so that led us to define what we now call our seven cultural cornerstones. So the first three on here, high performance and stretch, fun and entrepreneurial spirit, <coughs> they were there right from 2004. So when Aid spoke about their 30 somethings joining and they wanted to be you know, hard working, they wanted to have some fun along the way, they wanted to create something different, that is still very much a part of Cooper Paris culture today. The following four, they came from the back of that 2008, that period of pain. So recognising that we needed to bring back the goodwill and the trust of the people, be much more transparent about why we were making decisions that we were making. And also, if we really wanted to make the culture live and breathe, every single person living our values would be absolutely critical to us. So we've worked really, really hard to change the culture. This isn't something that's kind of just happened overnight. It's taken the past 10, 12 years to get to where we are today. It's been a long journey, we've made lots of mistakes along the way and we're still learning every single day and certainly not getting everything right. Um, but what I want to share with you is just some of the things that we're doing specifically around culture. So we, we map our culture increasingly against the Gallup uh, five principles of well-being. So Gallup, I don't know uh, if you're familiar with Gallup, so they're leaders in human research. Um, They've got a ton, of, a ton of research and a ton of science, and they've defined what they call the five principles of well-being, which make a happy, engaged life. So these are the Gallup five principles. This is about having physical well-being, about having a sense of purpose in your life, having social well-being, financial well-being, and really having a sense of community. So we've used this research from Gallup and the science from Gallup to create our own programme of engagement, which we call CP Heartbeat. Now, CP Heartbeat not only embodies the research from Gallup, but it also really embodies the culture that we want to create. So it's made up of six key areas, as you can see here. So CP uh, Houses, CP Feel Good, CP Family, CP Fun, CP Giving, and CP Bucket List. Now, I could take absolutely hours and talk you through all of these things, and that would be just a whole day's worth of chatting. So I'm conscious of time. I'm just going to go a bit deeper on some of those areas for you today, but I'll be around all day, and I'm around after today, if anybody wants to dig a bit deeper on any of those areas at all. I'm going to start with CP Bucket List. So CP Bucket List for us is all about making life count. And... Everyone in our business shares what's on their bucket list. So we use a digital platform for them to do that. And we ask them to share, what are your dreams? What are the things that you really want to tick off in your life? And then what we do is we match people together that have similar dreams and similar aspirations. And we help make those become a reality. So some examples are the picture you see here. It's a group of people did a cycle from Vietnam to Cambodia last year. We had another group of people that did the Great Wall of China trek. Um, Aid himself and a few others swam with sharks a few months back. Uh, why that would be on anyone's bucket list, I don't know, but it was. Um, but it's not always the big stuff as well. Sometimes it's the smaller things, so we have people that maybe want to learn to play the piano or want to master meditation. <coughs> but it's just about matching people together that have shared dreams and then making them become a reality. So it's all about experience. We want to create this really great experience and make life count. Um, because life matters and doing things that are purposeful in your life really matter to us. As does the health and well-being of our people. That's really important to us as well. So you saw a lot of the things on the wheel there. Uh, we have a huge range of activities um, related to health and well-being. So we have massages in house. We have yoga classes, mindfulness classes. We've done laughter therapy. Some of you have taken part in the laughter yoga today. We have a hairdresser, a beautician come on site. Um, but we also have a huge focus on mental health as well. So we do big campaigns around mental health, making it a really kind of open and transparent topic that it's okay to not be okay. We run mental health blogs that we get people to share their own life experiences with mental health, either directly or indirectly. And it's really kind of just opened the door on that being an acceptable thing for us to talk about. 
We're trialling heart monitors with a group of our people in a, a few weeks' time. So they'll wear a heart monitor for three days. We'll then be able to monitor their stress levels throughout the day on different days, depending on who they're meeting with and all that kind of stuff. Um, it'll also monitor their sleep levels. So uh, are they getting rest <coughs> enough restorative sleep or not? And what that will do, it will enable, enable us to look at that data as a theme. So what are the themes across our business? But then they'll be able to have personal one-to-ones where they look at what is it that's causing them stress and how can we help them put a plan in place to lead a happier, healthier, more stress-free life. Stress -free life. Um, so we just try all lots of things. We like to play, as, as they said, and experiment with different things and see what works. Um, we have a, a couple of sleep pods in both of our offices. Um, there's one just around the corner there if you've not seen it already. Again, the science to this stuff. So the evidence suggests that just a 20-minute power nap in the day will improve mental alertness by up to 30%. So, you know, have a go, go around and have a go later on today and see if you feel more mentally alert once you've had a little snooze. <laughs> uh, they look a bit space agey. Um, uh, here they are. That's just a picture of Aid having a little nap last week. So, just trying them. <laughs> We're just experimenting with these things. I'm living. Uh, yeah, um, and, and another area that um, is really important to us is around giving back um, and giving back to the community in particular. So we know again that the evidence and the research shows that particularly for millennials and Gen Z, it's really important now to work for businesses that do something more proactive for their community. Um, we've done loads of stuff for charity over the years. We've raised a ton of money, um, but what we've also found through talking to our people is that it isn't just about raising money, that's not what's important to them. What really matters is that they want to be able to give their time. And so we now um, hold a community day every year. So we, we literally close the office for the day. Everybody downs tools, they have the opportunity and are encouraged to take part in volunteering. Um, we'll open both of our offices this year to become a community centre for the day. So we'll have a food bank, we'll do CV writing workshops, loads of different things going on that will appeal to different aspects of our community. It's really, community is really important to us. Um, a really good example of that is last Christmas. So last Christmas we opened the office here and held a senior citizens Christmas dinner. And we invited uh, 23 senior citizens from across the community, two different care homes, a load of um, Cooper Parry's own friends and family, um, Elder, elderly relatives, and our oldest guest was this guy here, this guy, um, Eddie. Now, Eddie is 99 years old. He's a war veteran. He brought along to the meal all of his medals. He bought a photo album with like his life story in. Um, it, just even thinking about it, it kind of gets me choked up. So I struggle to even talk about it. But Eddie, first time he'd left his house in nine months. Yeah. First home cooked, hot, proper hot home cooked meal he'd had in years. So, you know, we'd get these microwave like meals on wheels, horrible, nasty, lukewarm dinners. First proper cooked meal. Um, and Steve, um, over there in the yellow t shirt, you've seen him also on the picture there. Steve is um, a Navy vet, and he's part of a, a veterans, a buddy veterans program connecting young vets with older vets. And um, Steve had said to us that. Normally when he goes to meet Eddie and chats to him, it's really hard to get a conversation out of Eddie because he's just kind of lost the art of communication because he doesn't see anybody. And after this event, uh, Steve drove Eddie home and he said he would not stop talking about the event, <laughs> which is just amazing, you know, and, and such a humbling experience for us. It's, it, it's probably one of the best things that we have ever, ever done. Um, and we are planning Eddie's 100th birthday party this year to, to hold our offices too. So, I've given you a little bit of a flavour of some of the things that we're doing uh, that are linked to our culture, and as I said, there's a ton of more stuff I could go into. Um, and it sounds like we've got it, like, you know, loads of this stuff nailed, but we haven't, and we haven't always got it nailed. And um, about four years ago, we had a bit of a reality check, in all honesty, because, um, you know, we, we started to feel the pressure, and, and I don't know if anyone ever feels like they're drowning, drowning in work. Um, and particularly when it comes to email, yeah? So four years ago, we uh, gave everyone an iPhone. And, you know, aren't we cool? Because, you know, we're hot on the tech and giving everyone an iPhone. But what we found was that really quickly, it became about being connected 
and who could send the latest email. And it was almost like a competition to prove who was working the hardest by sending the latest email. I'm sure that feels familiar to lots of people in the room. And we needed to, we needed to kind of snap out of that really quickly. That wasn't about the culture that we wanted to create. So we introduced an email curfew. So from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., we don't send any emails unless they're absolutely business critical. So we will call people out on this. When we first, in, first launched it, we would um, find people and the money would go to charity, but it really kind of started to drive how serious, seriously that we were taking this. So we don't send emails to people when they're on holiday either. Um, it's really, really important to us that people take that time to stop, to recharge and, and to refresh, which is why we also give our people unlimited holiday. So we completely trust them to take fully paid time off, as much time as they feel they need to recharge and to be more productive. And again, you know, there's evidence of this stuff. Just 10 hours more holiday a year will improve performance levels by 8%. That's a, that's a study by the British Psychological Society. So again, science and evidence to back this, back this stuff up. Um, so we really believe, truly believe in the power of taking, taking time out to recharge, trusting people to make the right decisions for themselves, trusting them to make the right decisions for the business. And um, you know, it's another reason why we give people absolute complete freedom for how they dress. Um, so we, we have a dress code policy at Cooper Perry. It's really simple. <laughs> to date, nobody's breached it. <laughs> so that's all good. Um, so, you know, unlimited holiday I've spoken about and dance bit classes and, you know, lots of fun stuff. And I get asked all the time, does anybody actually do any work at Cooper Perry? <laughs> And the answer is a very resounding yes. We have really, really high expectations of performance and of values. And if somebody isn't delivering, we absolutely call it out. It's really important to us from an engagement perspective of our great people as well that we're calling out those that aren't pulling, pulling their weight or aren't living the values. So you know, this looks like a strong message and it is a strong message we share this with every single new starter when we do our vision talk as part of their onboarding process um, we if people aren't living our values in particular and are toxic we call that out really quickly from a performance perspective you know we start from a position of support always but if we're not seeing an improvement and we're not seeing a change then we, we make we make the, the shift um, so we measure both performance and values in equal measure. Again, I could talk about this slide alone and the way that we do that in a lot of detail, um, but essentially every single person in our business is measured against performance and values, and it really helps us to identify those that are great, those that need some support. Um, it's also about recognising when people maybe aren't in the right role, and that's causing an impact on their performance and values, and it allows us to, to shift them into the right role so that they're really playing to their strengths as well. So... I'm going to take a little breather there for a second and just um, going to get to do something a bit more interactive. So you remember the Slido that you had at the beginning, yeah? Has everybody got Slido on their phones? So just grab your phones out for me. I'm just going to ask you uh, a quick question. Okay, so has anyone got children in the room? Just give me a show of hands. Oh, loads of you. Okay, great. So imagine for a second, a child comes home from school and they have the following report. I want you to just select on Slido which of these grades do you think deserves the most attention from you? The A, the C or the F? Looking like we've got a pretty strong A in the room. Some of you think C, some of you think the F, but mainly the A. We've got a good room in the good group in the room, okay. So let me tell you now that the, the, the research that Gallup have done, so they Gallup have studied uh, and asked this question over 40 years to different groups of people. And over the last 40 years, 77% 
of parents have chosen the F to focus on. Now, what the research shows actually is that we should really be focusing on the A. So it's great to see that so many people in the room are actually of that belief. And it's all about playing to people's strengths. What the research from Gallup also shows, which is really powerful, is that when you focus on a child's strengths, the stuff that they're good at, actually it improves their confidence, it, um, they're more focused, and they've even been able to evidence that they actually go on to have a more successful life. So bringing that back to, to business and to the workplace, imagine if we all spent time focusing on individuals' strengths and the things they're good at. Um, you know, most, most managers will spend their time focusing on the equivalent of the F, focusing on people's development areas, their weaknesses. You know, how many of you have had a manager like that that's focused on your development areas rather than on the things that you're good at? So we much prefer to focus on, on people's strengths. Uh, the research from Gallup also shows so a ton of other, other great stuff, but if you focus on strengths of your people, they're six times more likely to be engaged, 30% more productive, three times more likely to have an excellent quality of life. And that is the absolute like, kicker for me, that we can change people's lives outside of work by focusing on their strengths in work. That is just amazing. Also, clients 44% higher levels of satisfaction. So again, this has a real impact commercially as well. So imagine if every single person in your workplace was six times more engaged, 30% more productive, had a three times better quality of life, and your clients were 44% more satisfied. That would be pretty amazing, right? So our aim at Cooper Power is to try and help, first of all, everybody understand what those strengths are, because it's not easy to figure out things that we're good at, necessarily. Then we help them find a role that helps them connect to those strengths. So finding that sweet spot, really, where their passions and the stuff they're good at meet in the middle. That's what we're hoping to find for everybody at Cooper Power. So we've got a number of ways that we do that. So I've mentioned Gallup before, um, we use the Gallup Strength Finder tool as a tool to help aid those conversations. We do one-to-one -one coaches, both internally and externally. Uh, a lot of coaching um, to help people understand. And we also have a really in-depth management development program called Stellar Managers, which helps develop our managers to be able to have those strengths-based conversations and help people to discover what their strengths are. So again, I could go really deep on this, but Emily, Alan, uh, our head of L&D is going to workshop this afternoon on strength, so she'll be able to dig a bit deeper and, and uh, help you kind of um, unravel that a little bit more too. But really, it's about encouraging really open and honest and transparent conversations with people about what they're good at and, um, and where they could be better. So that level of transparency is really, really important to us. Um, and again, we haven't always got this right. So Aid spoke about back in 2008 and we weren't talking to people about what was going on and we, we're much better at it now. Again, still learning, but we hold a monthly um, CP holler, which is like an all hands meeting. So we do it both offices, face to face, we live stream it, we record it so everybody can watch. But it's about care, um, sharing, cascading information, but really it's about two way communication as well. So we will um, have a section at the end of every holler, which is uh, ask us anything, literally no question is, um, is not allowed. Uh, this was one of our hollers where we asked put to the floor, the hands just go up, we get tons, of, tons and tons of questions, really, really valuable for us. Uh, we also do a weekly happiness survey, dead simple, every single week on a Thursday, this goes out, closes on a Friday, two simple questions on a scale of one to ten, how happy are you at work this week? And the second question is, how can we make that score higher? Gives us a ton of information, is really, really valuable about different curves throughout the year rather than just one survey, one touch point in time. Gives us a real, real, real pulse on engagement levels across the business. Okay, so remember at the beginning when I asked you to think about what the culture was like in your business today? And you wrote down some words on a piece of paper. I want you to grab that piece of paper for me again, please. And I want you to turn over to a blank page, or turn the paper over for me, so you can't, can't see what you wrote. And I want you to now think just a little bit differently, and I want you to think about what is the aspirational culture that you'd like to create. So what would you like your people to say about the culture? How would you like it to feel? So again, I'm going to give you 60 seconds or so to write it down. And again, not going to have to share it with anybody else. 
Okay. Hopefully that's just got your minds thinking a little bit about the culture that you want to create. Can I just have a quick show of hands for anyone that wrote down the same thing for their aspirational culture as they did for the culture today? Okay. So that's fine, by the way. This is when we did this, this is exactly the same thing. What is the culture we've got today? What is the culture we want to create? And they weren't the same. There were some things, but they weren't all the same. The reason we do this exercise is we think it's really, really valuable to just stop and think about what is the culture that we want to create? What do we want it to look like? What's the vision? Because it's once you've got that clear in your mind, then you can start to put the steps in place to make that happen. And all too often, you know, I've done it myself, where you kind of rush ahead and start trying to create something, but you've not really stopped and, or put loads of in, you know, interventions in place, but you've not really thought about what it is that you're trying to achieve at the end of it. So we think it's a really, a really, really valuable and powerful exercise. So I'm now going to hand back to Aid. He's going to continue the story, um, and then I'm going to come and jump back on in a little while. He's going to continue the story quickly. <laughs> very, very quickly. <laughs> you have one minute left, yeah? yeah. Uh, okay, right. So uh, driving so much change hasn't, hasn't been easy. Um, you know, we're very fortunate we, that we have a very uh, supportive board here at Cooper Parry, but, you know, for the most part, you know, they want to focus on financial performance. They don't always get some of the stuff that April and I think we need to be doing. Um, you know, and they're rightly focused on financial performance. The, the really good thing, of course, is that by focusing on our people and our culture, we've been able to drive really great financial and business performance. So um, our revenues have doubled in the last three years to just over 40 million. We were the fastest growing firm of accountants in the country for the last two years. Three years ago, we were really proud to be named the most innovative firm of the year at our industry awards. Two years ago, uh, these guys called us the rebels of accountancy, so we quite like that. Um, that told us we were still on the right track. Yeah. Um, as Ruth mentioned earlier, we're the 13th best company to work for in the UK this year, and as Ruth said, we were named the best company to work for in Europe at the EA, EEA. And the next photo, I think, captures, um, well, it captures the moment that we heard that we'd won that award. Oh. Now, April hates this photo. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I can't see it's it. getting you back for the, the gag about the sleep pod, yeah? Um, but I, lo I mean, I love this. I mean, generally, this is like, you know, this really shows what it meant to April. If you can't see, she, she's, she's crying. And um, I don't know, she just realized she's now working for a firm of accountants. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we've been shortlisted for another 78 different awards. Or we've had a one or been shortlisted for 78 awards in the last two years. So we kind of know we're doing something right here. Um, but as April said, we don't, we're not standing still. Yeah? Uh, our brand continues to evolve. This is the latest iteration of our brand. The way we work continues to evolve, particularly with uh, technology. We're investing hard in technology. We have a big tech business here at Kupawi. We've got a team of 100 people. We've just been named Microsoft's World Partner of the Year, which we're phenomenally excited about. The way we work is changing. The workspace is changing. So where you're sitting doesn't normally look like this. It normally, it normally looks like this. So this is the latest stage of the evolution of our workspace um, and this. Uh, we opened in Bristol in December. 12 weeks ago, we moved into London. This is our office in London, uh, so we turn some space at WeWork in London. This is us now with 40 million turnover, Midlands, London, Bristol. That's the triangle that we're working in. The 30-year-olds are now 40-year-olds. Um, we're still incredibly ambitious. We're still entrepreneurial. We're looking forward. We set ourselves a very big, ambitious goal to build a 150 million turnover business by 2025 with national footprint in the UK. So we're essentially doubling in size every three years. Um, but in summary, just trying to we'll get this back on clock, um, I guess what we're trying to say here, the, pl the principle we believe in is if we, if we focus on building a great culture, we're going to attract the very best people in our market into our business. And if we, if we get the very best people and we create an environment where they can thrive and be themselves, we help them find a role that plays their strengths and their passions, then, hey, they're going to deliver a phenomenal service to our clients. And if we get this right, then our clients will become raving fans and we create a very successful business. And, and that's, 
That's what we believe. That's what works for us. So we believe that winning is is not about strategy. It's about it's about people. Okay. So we're very nearly at the end of the session. But before we wrap, I'm just going to ask Abel to come up uh, one last time and share with you one one final story before we wrap. Okay. <clears throat> so. Just another question to throw out there, if anyone in the room has challenges recruiting. Yep, so do we. Um, and particularly in Birmingham when we first moved there, um, because we weren't known in the marketplace at all there. But this uh, picture I'm going to show you here is the recent careers fair in Birmingham. So this is some of the, our team at our stand. Um, it was really busy, was loads of excitement, loads of people coming over talking to us. Um, and they were coming to us because they'd heard about our culture and that it was now about culture that they were hearing about. Now, the exact same event, same night, one of our competitors stands. <laughs> so, PwC. Now, if you look very carefully, there's a strap line there they have, which is take the opportunity of a lifetime. <laughs> it doesn't quite look like it's taking the opportunity of a lifetime, does it? Um, I'll stand on the left. Same event, again, same night. Another one of our competitors. Now, this guy on the right here was their representative. You know, the guy that is there to be the face of their culture. So... I actually find this really heartbreaking when I see this picture. It really upsets me because you send your best people out to these events, people that are really going to show and be the shop front for your business. And if that's what we sent out, I'd be pretty upset about that. And the really sad thing about this is he actually came over to our stand at the end of the night, gave us his card and asked us for a job. <laughs> so... Do you remember at the start when I shared with you my story about why I joined Cooper Parry, how the culture just sucked me in and I really wanted to be part of it, despite the fact that it was an firm of accountants. And my story here isn't unique. You know, the impact of our culture means that when we get people in front of us, we get people in our building, they want to work here. They want to be part of that journey. We've had our highest ever number of applications for our early years roles this year, so nearly 1,000 applications for just 40 vacancies. That was double the amount the year before and six times two years ago. That, for me, is the power of culture. So that's the end of our story. You'll be pleased to know. Thank you very much for being so patient and listening. I really hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you. <laughs>